Assalamu alaikum. alaikum. My name is Majid Ali Corker and I'm a dentist working in Wimbledon and South London and sometimes another practice. I'm a general dentist but I specialise in cosmetics and orthodontics as well. But the orthodontics is on a cosmetic level, so just certain things. Um, the difference being general dentistry is for if the patient walks in, you do a checkup, some cleaning, maybe some fillings or a root treatment and a crown. With cosmetics, you're looking at problems with their smile to make them look better. So a dark tooth or if they're unhappy with the, the arrangement of their teeth, um, then you can do veneers. And orthodontics is just straightening the teeth, uh, like the kids that have the train tracks. But I do more Invisalign, which are invisible braces and other techniques. So as a child, I was always a nature-orientated kind of boy. I used to like watching wildlife programs with my father. So I suppose science was something that naturally came to me, and I was good at science and maths. And career choice, uh, I was thinking about maybe something medical, but I wasn't sure. So when I was 12, I had two teeth taken out under sedation, so with the gas and sleeping. Um, and I felt that the experience was very clean and ethical and I just, it was, it was a good experience. So when I got home, I remember talking to my parents and saying, Ma, Ba, I think I know what I want to be. I think I want to be a dentist. And they looked at each other and smiled and I've just stuck with it since then. So when I looked further into dentistry, I could see there's a very competitive career choice. Uh, you have to get top grades, you know, the, the GCSEs, it has to start from GCSEs, they have to be pretty much all A's and B's. Uh, A levels need to be all A's, A stars. Um, but it's not only that, you need work experience. So I used to do every Saturday or every other Saturday work experience for about two years. Um, and that was quite a lot. But I used to enjoy it, you know, I'd chosen the profession, I, I used to love it. Every time I went, I'd see the patients with uh, my mentor and I'd actually be more encouraged to follow that career. Because some pay people I've seen who've done work experience with myself, they've been put off. Um, but it just enforced that I wanted to do that career. So after that, you hit your grades and you have an interview at a university. And they also ask you odd questions like, are you good with your hands, manual dexterity, and ask you to bring certain things to show them. So I did some woodwork, I showed them that. Um, they want to know about extracurricular activities. Uh, I've done the Duke of Edinburgh award scheme and just, you know, the sports that you play and other things like that to know that you're a well-rounded person, not just a bookworm who's good at studying, studying, studying. You have to have other extracurricular activities. My parents, uh, they're both Pakistani, but my mother likes to say she's Kenyan, third generation. Father is from Lahore. They met here, so I'm second generation Muslim, British, Pakistani. And it's like any typical upbringing. We had a very loving upbringing. Went to state school and some private school as well and grammar. So I had a mix of all educations. And the upbringing um, in terms of religion was um, the backing of uh, good Muslim parents um, practicing and um, also madrasa, which was very important. But um, the main influence in my teenage years was my mamu, my uncle who used to live with us for about four years. And he was the guy that I went to when I had any questions. There was no Sheikh Google at that time, so I used to speak to him about it. And uh, I remember one day I used to look up to him and I said, Mamu, when I grow up, I want to be just like you. And he looked back at me and he said, Majid, aim higher than me, because often where you aim, you don't reach that status. So we have the perfect examples in our Ahlul Bayt. So use them as your examples to aspire to be like them. And so from that point, I aspired to be like them. So as a child growing up in a um, UK environment, obviously the stereotype, you're a Muslim, the typical Ramadan and praying and they ask you questions. But if you just stick to what you know is best, which is stick to your principles and, you know, I'm a Muslim, I don't eat this meat, I only eat halal meat and I pray five times a day or three times a day because this is what God's requested. They're all aware of what, you know, what's going on. So we had in Hounslow, which is where I'm born and bred, there's quite a few Muslims. So people were aware of that. But it's still difficult, you know, there's, you mix with different Muslims. Um, but in that time when I was growing up, things were quite pleasant. Although there was some rivalry with other Asians and Sikhs and Muslims had problems. But we all grew out of it. So you just have to stick to your principles and the fundamentals, the basics that you're taught. Uh, and be good to, you know, your fellow 
Muslims and humanity, as Imam Ali has said. You know, if he's not your brother in religion, he's your equal in humanity. And that's the principle you should stick with. As we were growing up, it was early stages of development of Shia Islam. And so in West London, we didn't really have a mosque initially. There was, there was Hammersmith we used to go to, but in the hounds of itself, it used to be a house that we used to learn Quran from, certain teachers, some aunties were there. It was your traditional basic setup. But that was still a very good foundation for us to from blossom from in terms of religion. And then we went to, I used to travel to Pina, to a Khorja establishment as, as madrasa. Um, so this environment was very healthy. Another big influence for me in my life was my grandfather. And he was a very staunch Muslim and Shia. He only regarded whatever Allah's will was, he went for that. He wasn't shy of anyone, he, he didn't, didn't pander to the crowds. I remember once we were in America in SeaWorld and um, it was namaz time and he said, right, we're going to pray. And I was like, where are we going to pray? We're in the middle of people are going left, right, center. There's a little green patch between everybody moving around and he said, we're going to pray here. And I remember standing behind him being so embarrassed, I was about eight or ten, and uh, standing behind him just thinking the whole world is looking at me. Um, but as I've grown up, I've learned to appreciate that, and now I'm similar to him in those ways. I pray at work, my nurses often ask me, oh, you know, what are you doing? What's, what's the meaning of this at university? All these places, um, if you're not shy, then people tend to come towards you and ask you about your faith because it's a, it's a natural act to pray to God and um, to split your day into certain points where you're actually contemplating about God. So I now thank my granddad for those principles he set within me, even though at the time I was quite embarrassed. Also, uh, when I was at university, um, I was enrolled on an Al-Asr course with uh, Mulana Sabazwari, and it was a trip to Iran. And it was my first major trip, you know, without the parents and um, to a religious environment, so it was for Ziara, and I didn't really know what to expect, I was quite a young 19 year old boy, but mashallah, it was an amazing experience, you know, we were taught um, lessons every morning, we prayed Fajr on time, there was no laziness, and um, when we visited the Haram, it was just a beautiful experience, because I visited other places before, I did Umrah when I was 10, but you don't remember much, so this was older, and the experience was much more spiritual and learned put a fond memory about being humble in what you do. And the Imam, obviously, when I visited him and his sister, Masim Akhum, um, the same humbleness, the piety, the peacefulness, it all followed through my university. And that's how I took that lesson from that experience. So dentistry is like any other career. Um, once you get involved in it, you can really get en engrossed into it. And you can forget, forget about the important things in life. So you, you, know, you worry about your bills and the tax man and this paycheck and patients and complaints and whatnot. So you forget about the most important things in life, which is you know, um, your spiritual spirituality. Okay? And the, most, the, the best way I found to be more spiritual was to go to Ziyara and visit the, the, the holy tombs and um, go to Hajj, my experience in Hajj, which really, really awakened my soul. I, I felt it. So about six or seven years ago I had the pleasure of going to Iraq with my mother, which I was excited to do. One, because I was taking my mother to Ziyarat, and two, because I was going to meet the Imams and the Holy Ahlul Bayt. And obviously you're apprehensive, I'd never been there before, but it's, it's an odd sensation. As soon as you land uh, in Karbala, you just get this, it's like, well, I was describing it as a hug. It's like Somebody's holding you and just, even I'm now I'm getting emotional, it's just a warmth that you get immediately. There's a sadness there as well, um, which you feel also immediately. For instance, when we went to Najaf first, you get the same warmth, but there's no sadness. There's strength, it's, it's odd. But in Karbala, it was, there was definitely a sadness there. And that, that, that feeling didn't leave me until I remember clearly when I landed in, uh, in London, my first Salah, it was like it disappeared. I still prayed but, and I still had the fond memories, but that, that warmth, that hug was not there anymore. And your soul, it's, I remember just reading about it and I was trying to find out why that happened. And it's because your soul has tasted pure love. And then suddenly you've come back and you get stuck in your ways again and you're far away. So your soul needs that again. 
And so when I used to go into Sajda, I used to remember the, the land of Karbala and it used to take me back to that land and that time with my mother visiting the holy Imams and the, the holy lands and the graves and it was just a beautiful experience, you know, and seeing the whole, the mass of people, it was in Arbaeen and the, the masses of people that were there and um, when they, they actually make the, the waters go red and uh, there's sand everywhere and they have the horses and they reenact the whole experience that happened to Imam Hussein and his, his companions it really makes you visualize it and you, you just feel it in your bones it's, it's a really special experience that I recommend to anybody who hasn't been so as I said before you when you're working you get bogged down and you're worrying about all the other problems and uh, sometimes you get a little jolt when you're praying Salah or for mine it was when I was um, in a Jummah Khutbah and the uh, Imam was uh, talking about Hajj and he said a person who hasn't done Hajj and they die and they could have performed it, they die the death of a, a, a non-believer. You, you're basically the same as a, a, a Jew or a Christian, an ignorant person. And um, then he explained it further. He said that, you know, if you had bought a car for, let's say, £4,000 and you didn't really need that car, you could have put that towards Hajj. Any spare money, buying a house. Everybody, you know, buys a car or a house, even going on a course, some people do courses. Any sort of investment that you have, renovating your house, if you could spare 2,000, 3,000 pounds, then really that's haram, you should have done hajj with that. And so you're living a life, if you die at that point, you, you really have no chance. You're going to get questioned and you have no answers for that. And I had everything, I had a career, car, house, wife, and I had had my son, my first son, Isa Muhammad. And I just had no excuse and I felt embarrassed while I was listening to this khutbah. And so embarrassed that I, I spoke to my cousin and I said, let's, let's just do it. He was actually telling me to do it as when I was trying to make excuses as you do. No, maybe next year, my son is only six months old, I can't do it, you know, he needs me. And um, really it was a reality check when that khutbah happened and um, I signed my name and Alhamdulillah I went to Hajj that year in 2014. And it was one of the best experiences of my life. It really again, highly spiritual experience. When you see the Kaaba for the first time, it's just a, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal experience because all your life you pray to this direction, but you don't really see it. And I don't know how many people visualize it, you don't often visualize it. But when you're there standing in front of this amazing spectacle and you're seeing all the people going round and round, praying to this one true Lord, and you know that in your back of your mind, the, the Malakut, the angels are doing the same thing in the heavens, it's a special experience. You're actually there at that point where everybody, it's a spiritual vortex. It's just pure energy and you feel that. The same as Karbala, the same as all the other places, the holy sites. It's the spirituality that we, our soul needs and we forget to feed our soul. We feed our bodies, we feed our minds. It's fine, but you don't feed your soul and you must feed your soul. But this is a wajibat, so you may do your ziyarats, but don't forget your Hajj, it's extremely, extremely important. It's, it's one of the rocks of Islam, it's, it's a pillar of Islam that you must do. And this was an experience that I will never forget. As, as you're going through your career, you, you often think about how you can help others. Being a good Muslim, a big part of that is not just doing things for yourself or your family, but the community and globally as well. But if you start with your family and community, then you can go globally after that. So with, with myself, uh, I had an opportunity to start teaching at Madrasa in Husseini Mission and I did that for maybe seven, eight years. I started with uh, six, seven year olds and then different ages and by the end of it I was teaching 10, 11, 12 year olds and that is one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. You know, I, it's very difficult, it's, I, won't, I won't lie, you have to plan and prepare. It's a Sunday morning, I like to sleep in sometimes, it's difficult. Um, but when you see those kids and their faces and when they learn something or you see that light bulb and, and you're not just teaching them maths or English which is also highly commendable but this is Islamic studies so it's fiqh, akhlaq and history and Quran it's a different reward that you're getting so one you're helping your community but these people are going to then teach others if, even if it's just their children but the sadqai jari that you're going to get is phenomenal um, but you see these children their faces light up you try and make it exciting for them and that's your challenge one that it's exciting because kids get bored very quickly two that they actually learn something from that excitement 
and that's the main thing and uh, the feedback that I got alhamdulillah uh, a lot of them still contact me we've got a whatsapp group and even recently they're, they're questioning me about different things and I've always said my phone my doors are always open to you if you have any questions come back to me and they do and that also goes into the community so I've uh, studied in East London and I, I used to have a flat in Battersea in Clapham Junction so I was part of Haythery I've been to the Romford Centre uh, in Wimbledon, I go to Idara for Juma prayers. I work in West London, so I'm in Reading, and also in Crawley. I'm all over the place, and Husseini Mission, obviously. So I do meet members of all different communities, and um, they tend to try and see me as a dentist because they see me at Friday prayers, they see me at the Wiladas and the Shahadas. So uh, a lot of people follow me around. So Alhamdulillah, I try and put back into the community that way, and I give them slightly special treatment because obviously they're friends and family and community but also when they hear and they remember that I'm a dentist they send their children for work experience and which I really enjoy it's like teaching them and if I can just help them make that journey to become a dentist even a small part again it's just very very rewarding and that's how I try and help the community also charity work you know there's a charity called Who is Hussein um, which is run by some very energetic and spiritually motivated people and I've done a few sessions with them and they had a dental session where there were eight different dentists and we pitched up a tent in the middle of the Strand, central London and we saw maybe 30, 40 patients coming in, homeless people and that was very, very rewarding, so rewarding to be helping people in the name of Imam Hussein, which is what he died for and um, they also hand out leaflets and roses and it's just that awareness that they, they get and that's every Saturday that happens. But also I've done uh, trips abroad so I've been to a centre in, um, it's called Wipas um, in uh, Zanzibar and Dar es Salaam mainly and they are a charity and they have all uh, the local Kenyan kids and the Tanzanian kids and they teach them the whole thing from school. It's basically a Muslim girls school and they teach them Dua Kumail and everything from a young age to a higher age and there's maybe two, three hundred children there they have a well there, they have a hospital there, it's expanding very quickly and I did some charity work there and also I've been abroad so when um, the Syrian problem which is still ongoing a lot of refugees were coming to Greece and France and we had a group of dentists and medics and hygienists, I took my sister as well um, we went to Calais and Dunkirk and we helped the, the local refugees that were there, helpless, you know. And it was a very humbling experience because one, one guy, he just kept watching me and he said, can I please watch how you take teeth out? Can I watch you do this? Can I watch you do that? And I said, why do you want to watch me do this? He goes, because back home in Syria, I'm a dentist. And I had a normal life, I had a car, I had a flat, I had a career. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly, in an instant, I was sent back and uh, I had to become a refugee. And it's not something that I wanted, but I just miss seeing that work. And he just watched me all day and we exchanged numbers, alhamdulillah. And that was just a very humbling experience. We helped children, helped older people. It was just a mixed experience. But to see them live in squalor, it was just tents and there was mud and earth everywhere. But they were all extremely happy and extremely grateful for the work that we did. And this is ongoing. There's so many charities. There's another one, HPF uh, Human Organization, that we help. And I'm part of that. And I'm inshallah planning a trip to Lesbos that they do, which is a Greek island where all the refugees are as well. So inshallah, that's another thing for the future. My day starts uh, with uh, waking up for Fajr Salah. I try and wake up a bit earlier to do what I can before, but um, it's not easy, but I'm trying. Um, Fajr Salah is where I start. And then at the moment it's, it's early, so I'll go back to sleep. And then when I wake up, I have my shower, get ready. I have some honey, some water, it's sunnah. And then I'm off on my journey. In the car, uh, there's no music. I don't listen to music. Uh, it may sound a bit odd, but I've done that for probably a decade more than that now. And it's either Radio 4, which is informative. I like to listen to the news to be up to date with the happenings of the world. So I can talk to my patients and just it's better to be aware of the, the world environment. And also du'as and Qur'an. And I love listening to beautiful recitations, or Umar bin Hashim, or um, other, other reciters, Mishari al -Afasi. And so I'll be driving to work, or I take the train, depending on where I work. And uh, I'll start the day, I have to come in my normal clothes, and then change into my scrubs. So these are my scrubs, and they have to be clinically clean. 
Um, we have to wear gloves, as you've seen in the videos before. This is a visor that we wear to protect our eyes and then a mask that goes over the, the mouth. So a normal day, as you saw in the video, is um, seeing the patients. And what I've learned more and more over the years is that you often forget that there's a person behind the teeth. Um, so you have to talk to the patient, get to know them, and that makes a better dentist. All right? You must be personal with them. Okay? Ask them about their career, ask them about their studies, ask them about their wives, their kids, just their lives. Okay? They're human beings just like you would treat somebody else or your family. But after you've greeted and seated the patients, you've asked them how they've been and any updates. Um, you go through their medical history, any updates in that, and the social history, and then you discuss um, any, any concerns that they have, and they'll tell you, you know, I've got this broken tooth or this pain here. And you do an extensive examination, check the outside, so the lymph glands, see if there's any infection. Then the TMJ, which is the joint here, opening, closing. And then internally, obviously, you're checking the soft tissues, the lips, the gums, the tongue. And then it's the hard tissues like the teeth. Um, obviously, there's an oral cancer search as well. You have to check that. The hard tissues are the teeth. If you have any decay or you're suspicious or they're due, you take x-rays. And um, it's a low radiation x-ray that has to be done just to see what you may miss visually. Because obviously, the eyes can't penetrate hard tooth. And the x-rays go straight through. After that, you make a, a plan with the patient. If they're in pain, then the main thing is to get them out of pain. <coughs> Excuse me. And it may be um, drilling the tooth after giving them an injection and relieving the pain, <coughs> or just antibiotics if they have swelling, or often it's just something that the small thing that you just flick off and smooth for them. It just depends on the problem. It's a whole variety of problems. As I said previously, when I went to Karbala, I had a, a spiritual experience with Imam Hussain and that bond never goes. Um, you do get wrapped up in the daily rigmaroles of life and routine and, but every time you think back at that moment and it helps if you go there so if you haven't been to Karbala make sure you go. It's very very important because you you can read books you can watch videos but the, the experience that your body and your soul feels when you're actually there is, is uh, you, you can't compare that to anything you cannot compare it so I do highly recommend that and you can always go back mentally to that point. So when you are feeling down and tired of working or stressed, or, then you often think about the struggles that other people have had. And the most important sacrifice in the whole of creation is Imam Hussein's. So nothing compares to that. So any problems that you're having in your life, do not compare to that. And so I can always fall back on that. And that not only makes me feel that life isn't that difficult or this situation isn't that hard but it also makes me want to help others because people forget that the most important thing was not only his sacrifice on the battlefield but Salah. People often forget that. They worry about martyrdom and different things but the most important thing was Salah. That prayers was the most important thing. Okay? They actually requested for some respite to pray and it was so important that the arrows were flying and his companions were used as human shields to protect him and they were sacrificed. And if, that, if prayers wasn't that important, he wouldn't have done that. So people often forget that. And that's why that's helped me incorporate that into my life. So at work, I pray at work, as I've said before. It's an important part of my life. I try and split my prayers so that I think about God five times a day. So I'll pray Fajr at home, and then Zohar at work. And then when I get home, Asr, then Maghrib and Isha. And at work, it just helps me stop what I'm doing and think about my Lord, my Creator, and that's the reason why I'm here. And that lesson is from Imam Hussein because that's exactly what he did. He only thought about his Lord and his Creator and didn't worry about all the small people and the worries of life. And that's how it helps. You just get on with life that way.